97.3 ESPN presents The Sports Bash with Mike Hill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. Powered by InsideTheBirds.com. He's in! Touchdown! Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you locally today by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to 250 bucks. Go to PlaySugarHouse.com. Win real money with the sports book along with casino games from the comfort of your home. Must be 21 or older to play. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Andrew DeCecco is in the house today for today's Football at Four. No Football at Four tomorrow. We've got the Flyers hockey at 3 o'clock right here. On 97.3 ESPN. Well, we had a lot of football today. We have the NFC East Day. We've talked to Tim McManus, Jordan Ronan, John Keim. Coming up later, we'll talk to Todd Archer. But right now, it's our very own Andrew DeCecco in the house here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. What's going on, Andrew? Hey, Mike. I'm doing well. How are you? It's a uh, football-feeling day. We've been in a football mood all day today with the Sixers going out and the Flyers losing last night. We need a little football in our lives, and it feels kind of good talking uh, some pigskin today. So let's dive into some of the stuff uh, that is going on. Uh, I I do want to start with what you wrote about at the website yesterday at 97.3ESPN.com, Duke Riley and that linebacker spot. You know, you mentioned an intriguing skill set yesterday, Jim Schwartz talking. And are we getting a better sense of what this linebacking core might look like. Yeah, as the dust sort of settles and we move towards the start of the regular season, you really look at what the Eagles have with their seven linebackers. And there isn't, it's, it's kind of top heavy, if you want to call it that. They have two guys in TJ Edwards and Nathan Gary, who, for all intents and purposes, for better or for worse, they're going to be your two starters. And then there's a drop off, right? So one of the things that I outlined is you have, for the third role, you have Duke Riley. You have Sean Bradley, you have Davion Taylor, you have Dante Olsen, you have Alex Singleton. Alex Singleton's going to have to take on a larger special teams role, more likely, because obviously Nathan Gary and T.J. Edwards, who were their two top performers last year, have their hands full on defense. And, you know, the two rookies that have a long way to go in Bradley and and Taylor, even though Bradley's really stood out this training camp, it's a lot different when, you know, when you're in live action. And um, that's something that's going to take a little bit longer for those guys to get their sea legs, if you will. Um, so that leads me to Duke Riley. And one thing that really stuck out to me when you heard Jim Schwartz talk about Duke Riley is, you know, he contributed when he was out there, which wasn't very often last year on defense. I believe it was only 28 snaps or something and more, more so in goal line formation. Um, but what he did do, what he does bring to the table is he's incredibly fast. Yes. He does. He lacks the prototypical stash for a linebacker, which really limits his ceiling, but he's incredibly fast. He moves well sideline to sideline, and he has an outstanding coverage acumen, which he is the most proficient in coverage out of all the linebackers. And when you look at what teams are looking to do and spread teams out, uh, his skill sets can be very uh, be an asset for that for the defense. And I think he has among the most experience of the linebacking core. So, but you know, it's it's his job to lose, really. Yeah, and I want to, uh, you know, you mentioned the rookie linebackers. What about the kid Olsen uh, that a lot of people were intrigued by? Is he even on the radar at all? Unfortunately, with this off season, I would have to say no. Under normal, under normal circumstances, I would say I would have the tendency to say yes. We're talking about a guy who had 397 tackles for Montana. He was if he if he didn't run a 4.8 at the NFL Combine, you're talking about a guy who's probably getting drafted on, on day three. And he looked good in the Shrine Bowl. He has a very strong football IQ. He's a little bit. He reminds me a little bit of Sean Bradley in the sense that he brings that leadership. He, he always knows what he's doing. He has that football intellect doesn't necessarily have the athletic traits that you look for in the linebacker position, but he's a guy that's going to probably play in the league for a very long time. Yeah, that's Dante Olsen that we're uh, referring to there. And, you know, you look at uh, Nate Geary, who, like it or not, he's probably going to play a lot out here. Um, You know, I I wonder, is Geary – I don't want to say uh, better, but, I mean, is he a guy – why do the Eagles see more in him than maybe the fans do? I would say he's someone who they've seen him put in the work. He, when he came to the Eagles, he was uh, converted. He was safety at Nebraska, right? So he was, he came, he was very small. He still is small, but he, he came in at like 218 or 220 pounds, kind of like what Davion Taylor weighs right now. And they saw him take the gradual progression every single season. He grasped what Ken Flagel was 
was preaching to his linebacking core. And he not only did he grasp it, he saw it translate onto the field where maybe some other guys for communication reasons or whatever, they just weren't grasping it. And he kind of earned their trust by, you know, knowing what to do, being where he needed to be. Is he a little bit limited athletically? Yes. But he does. He's a guy that's going to be dependable. You know what you're going to get out of him. He doesn't have a very high ceiling, but he's dependable. And, you know, right now, unfortunately, he's one of their top two guys for better or for worse. So, you know, like it or not, like you were saying, he's going to be a starter. When looking at Taylor, who was drafted in the third round, everyone knows at this point he's probably more of a project. How much time do you anticipate him to get on the field to develop and grow into something that one day can be more of a starter role? That's a great question, Hunter. And when we talk about the lack of a preseason hurting guys, Davion Taylor is one of the prime examples of someone who this really hurts. I would also say Casey Tuhill as well. These are guys that, like you said, they really need these preseason reps, you know, game action. You can only do so much in practice, you know, throw them out there and see what they're going to do against the opposition in a game that may not matter, but they really need to get these snaps um, against other players and, you know, sitting a season out, which is essentially what he's going to be going to be doing. It's kind of a Richard season for Davion Taylor. He, he outside of the maybe special teams uh, role that he may have. I don't anticipate that coming early on, but possibly later in the season, it's probably going to take a couple seasons for him to really, really be able to kind of make his mark on defense because he has such a long way to go. He's very inexperienced. The athletic traits are there. He's incredibly fast. He has a lot of explosive traits, but, you know, having those traits and being able to utilize them, um, you know, at, at, the, at the professional level are two different things. And I think that the transition is going to be a little bit longer than when many uh, kind of expected when he was drafted. I want to ask you about a couple of first-round picks. One, Jalen Rieger, who um, earlier today Tim McManus mentioned that he's going to be a big part of the offense. He admitted that, you know, hey, yeah, he's making an impact on the field. And uh, it's something that you wrote about at InsideTheBirds.com is how he's kind of prospering out there. So let me ask you, do you think that he is a little bit ahead of maybe what they thought he would be considering the offseason? Yeah, I think as far as rookie receivers go, especially, you know, in, in such an abbreviated offseason, they have to be encouraged with, with what they've seen from, from, from Jalen Rager from the early goings. And, you know, like I was saying, like I wrote about and like I've said on, on, on the show, he has, has been billed as someone who is a quick study and who, who you know, he thrives in, in, you know, move him around and get him in space and put him in, the, in you know, in, in a versatile role. And those things kind of transpired on the practice field. You saw him being cross-trained, and he really, he really picked up what you know Aaron Moore had has been implementing to the wide receivers. And you saw him running with the with the starting unit throughout the entirety of the summer for you know the better the better part of you know three or four weeks here. And he's taken the advantage of his opportunities, he's made plays, and you know he's kind of adjusted seamlessly to the offense, which is so rare for a young wide receiver. And really, when you look at what the Eagles have, he kind of has to be. You know, he has to not not to put any pressure on a first round pick, but he really has to be ready to go for week one because you look and you see you have Deshaun Jackson and you have, you know, there's a lot of moving parts there and you really need your first round pick because he brings something to the offense that a lot of a lot of the players that are on the roster don't have. The Eagles obviously have been out on the field for a little bit of time now. So what has stood out to you the most at this point at training camp? I would say the defensive line rotation um, is, you know, it's ferocious right now. They they are just getting after, you know, the offensive line, which is, you know, it has, yes, it's retooled, but it does have a lot of veterans on that line. Um, and I would say that it, it's very encouraging to see, you know, the top four defensive ends, which was kind of a question mark going into the off season. How were, how were they going to kind of distribute the reps? You know, is that, where does Benny Carey fit in? Is he coming back? Well, yeah, now he's back. He's in that third role. Josh Sweat's having a great summer. The question that I have now is what becomes of the fifth defensive end spot, which is kind of a good problem to have when you're assessing the unit when you're looking at who, who's going to win the fifth role. But that defensive tackle trio is the best in football, and they're proving that on the practice field. They're giving the offensive line fits. That's really all you can ask for. Uh, the other, uh, you know, we just talked about Jalen and uh, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, who was a second-round pick last year, and I know, um, you know, a lot of people hoping that he's able to take that step forward. We're three weeks from the regular season. What improvements or advancements have you seen in him? Well, as Jeff reported, you know, he got some work in the slot, which is something that I didn't, I didn't foresee happening, you know, given his body type and the lack of a, another X receiver on the roster outside of Alshon Jeffrey, who, as we know, won't be ready for the first few weeks of the season at least. 
Um, so it's nice to see that he's kind of developed that versatility. He's a little bit behind, you know, I, I believe he's fourth in the pecking order behind, you know, Rager, Deshaun, Greg Ward, um, you know, and that's fine, but it's nice to see him making, you know, his confidence is there again. He's making these touchdown, the, the red zone touchdown receptions that he was kind of touted for and known for in college. Um, so, you know, he's, he, and, and he's healthy last season for, you know, you know, for what it's worth, he, he kind of, he admitted that he battled through some injuries and, um, I don't know if that was fully to blame for some of the some of the egregious errors that he made on the field, but it, maybe that maybe that speaks to the fact that he wasn't he he looked to be one of the slowest players on the field a lot of the time when he was out there really laboring in in his routes and and that's something that kind of you know it makes a lot of sense now when you look at it. So hopefully he's able to carry this momentum onto the regular season because we've seen a lot of guys in the past that they look great in the summer, but you know like a Shelton Gibson in 2018, but you know when the when the lights come on and and they need the, they need those guys to deliver on the field. They don't. They're not always you know ready to do that. Um, you know what about Greg Ward? Uh, I think feel like it feels like people are you know I don't want to say trying to write him off. I think the fans want to see him in there, but it was almost like um, where does he fit in? You got the first round pick. You got Sean Jackson. You got a second round pick. Uh, what is Ward's camp been like? He had a good camp last year. Didn't make the team. So is he holding? Uh, people off. I mean, is he, do you see that he will be in the top three? Well, the thing that, you know, I, I do agree with you, and I think he's being unfairly written off. And, you know, a lot of times fans and, and you know, fans of the NFL in general, they're, they they become enamored with, like, you know, the shiny new toy. They always are looking for an upgrade. Um, and, you know, maybe Greg Ward's not the flashiest player. He's not the fastest. He doesn't have the, the measurables that, you know, like let's say a CD lamb will be a slot receiver for Dallas. He doesn't have those type of measurables, but what he does bring is a lot of heart. He brings a full knowledge of the playbook. He brings uh, a rapport an established rapport with Carson Wentz. He's going to catch the football and yeah, he can maybe do some gadget things for you. Obviously he was a prolific quarterback at the university of Houston. Give me somebody like that on my team, you know, any day of the week that, you know, you can depend on, on third down and, and, you know, it's going to make those catches. And I think the fact that he has the confidence of the entire coaching staff, you know, having, having done it for the better part of the second half of last season and, and really stepped up when nobody really was, and when Carson Wentz was just looking for any receiver to throw the football to, you know, Greg Ward answered the call. Like you said, he got cut three different times, three different summers. He should have made the team. You could have made an argument that he should have made the team each of those three summers. Um, he was kept in, you know, other players were kept in favor of him, uh, unjustly. And, you know, he really capitalized on his opportunity and, um, and obviously the Eagles like what they've seen in his progression. And that's why he's running with the first unit. All right. Um, what about Andre Dillard? Because uh, you mentioned Rieger, the first round pick, he was a first round pick too. I think people almost forget that he was a first round pick and, uh, now he's getting the opportunity to start. He's kind of been in and out of the lineup. They do have Jason Peters here, but they're, they're kind of, uh, I don't want to say dead set on keeping him at guard, but uh, how has Dillard handled this spot? And if Dillard were to get hurt or to go down, would they move Peters back to left tackle, or do you think that might be somebody else? Well, to answer the first part of your question, I, I do think that Dillard's taken the next step that we all hoped that he would take, and he's, he added the weight. I believe he gained about 20 pounds in the offseason, and, and, and it ended up being you know good weight. He really needed that from, you know, being able to anchor in the running game and, and handle his own, um, you know, in pass protection. From what I understand, he's looked pretty good on one-on-ones. He's held his own there. And in pass protection, he's been a little inconsistent in, in the full team, the full team, you know, drills. But, you know, that he, he's, you know, light years away from where he was this time last year. And that's, and that's a great thing and very encouraging if you're the Eagles. Uh, I think what the Eagles did in, you know, kind of, you know, reaffirming to him, hey, you, you know, you're our left tackle Jason is going to be here at right guard. And then, you know, not moving Jason at left tackle when Dillard got hurt and, you know, putting Jordan Mylotta in there. I think that can do a lot for a young player's confidence. And I think that's an overlooked aspect of in, in the terms of development. You know, I, I think that he really needed to have that confidence along with, you know, knowing that the team was backing him fully and he's got a new, a new body type and he's, he's ready to go. So I think that the Eagles should be encouraged with, with what they've seen from him. Um, and I think that, you know, in a game situation, yes, I do think that Jason Peters would probably would, you know, most certainly be the guy that would come in there at le- left tackle uh, because he, he's the established guy and you don't want to mess around when you're talking about protecting your quarterback's blind side. Where do you think that Jordan Maialata is right now? Because he has been playing the left tackle position at the moment when Dillard is out. So, you know, where do you think that he is at this moment? 
Well, Jordan Mailata, he's he's someone that needs he needs reps, and you saw what he was able to do last summer. He's fantastic. I believe it was in the Jackson Jacksonville Jaguars preseason game going against their first unit. You know, he's been on IR the last two seasons, and he really hasn't had the, the necessary reps. And this oh, this offseason, he got even fewer reps than he needed. But I think the more that you, what you see with Milano, the more that he's out there and the more reps that he gets, the better he's going to get. But, you know, this season, he's going to be buried behind um, behind the starters. He's also going to have a guy like Matt Pryor who's going to be playing in favor of him. But I think Milano, he's still a work in progress. People forget about how young he is. I think he's still a year away from being somebody they can actually put out there and have faith that he can hold his own. I want to get uh, your opinion on Corey Clement. I mean, I know that um, uh, Miles Sanders is is nicked up, but he's anticipated to be ready for the opener. Same with Boston Scott. Um, but the team doesn't seem to be going you know, out of their way to try to find a veteran guy. Is that an indication that Corey Clement not only makes a team, but that if he's asked for an expanded role, that they think that he can handle it? Yeah, sure. I do think it's a nod to Corey Clement. I, I, I like I like the Eagles' approach with this. They weren't they were committed to a certain number, and they weren't willing to exceed that number when looking at veteran free agent running backs. They were able to take a look at what they really had and get a long look at that. And a lot of that was probably you know contingent upon Corey Clement's. How is he coming back? Does he look like the Corey of of old, or or should we be concerned and look to add somebody? And I think what you saw from Corey Clement is he's got his burst back. He's got his. You know, he, he's running with confidence. He's seeing the holes better. He's seeing the field better. And he, he's looking, he has that explosion back that he had, you know, when he had that great season in 2017 when he kind of emerged in the second half of that season and, of course, on, on the grand stages of the Super Bowl. And I think he gives the Eagles a lot of, you know, a lot of confidence being that third running back. And he can also, he's also tremendous on special teams. So I think that, when you, like you said, Miles Sanders, and Boston Scott will, should be ready to go for the opener. And having a veteran like Corey Plummer as your third running back, I think the Eagles are, are doing right by that and, and sticking with that trio. It looks like Zach Ertz's contract negotiations are in play. How does this impact Dallas Goddard's future here? Well, actually, I think a lot of it depends on on how the young receivers play this year, right? So how does how does Greg Ward, how does J.J. Arcega Whiteside, how does Jalen Rager play this year? Because those guys are all on, you know, they're, rel- they're low-cost options relatively. So if those guys can prove that they can be a nucleus, well, then maybe you find a way to keep both of those guys and, and make yourself, you know, a, a two tight end team. Um, you saw a lot of but you, they, both players create so, so many mismatches on the field, and you saw – what the Patriots could do when they have both of their guys there. And I think that the Eagles have something with both tight ends. So if you can find a way to keep both of them while having those young receivers around there that can, they can also implement that you can also implement into the passing game. I think that's a great thing to have, but I think a lot of it will have to do with what happens this, this season with those guys. I want to get your take on um, uh, the, uh, I don't know what his, his offensive assistant, uh, Rich Scangarello, who spoke today for the first time, and that was essentially what he was asked out of the shoot. What's your role? Uh, they don't really have an offensive coordinator. So how do you see the offensive setup uh, working this year? Um, I think you're going to see, you know, obviously you're going to see a lot of two tight end sets. You're going to see little subtleties and formations and, and play action and and things like that. I think Rich Scangarello brings a lot of great ideas, and I think that the Eagles have the way that the offensive minds are constructed. You have three different people that can bring all these different ideas and concepts into the offense. So I think you're going to see. Well, I know that they said that there are not going to be you know many changes to the offense, but I think you'll see a lot of them you know in, in, in different areas such as play action and in the screen game and things like that. All right, uh, you know uh, one thing is for sure. Uh, the Eagles are just three weeks away, and uh, one of the things that you know you look at here is the quarterback Carson Wentz. Five years in, we talked a little bit about this with Tim McManus, and he uh, he said that uh, Carson almost caught himself. He's like, "This is my fifth year," and was kind of like, "Wow, this is my fifth year." So going into year number five uh, with Carson Wentz, I mean, you never want to waste the prime years of your franchise quarterback. So um, let me get your vision of year five, Carson Wentz. Yeah, I think if, if if Carson stays healthy, the pieces around him are there for him to have the best season he's had. The offense is an upgraded version of the 2017 group that he had, and you saw what he was able to do with that. I think that, more importantly, Carson took 
a big step forward last season from a leadership perspective. He took he takes ownership of the offense. He elevates the performance of the guys around him. And I think that, you know, it, having weathered that storm last season, he's ready for everything. And I think that really helps take his game to another level. Now, do I want to put any stats out there? Yeah, I think he can throw for 35, 37 touchdowns. I think he can throw for 4,500 yards. And, you know, you have the running game to back on too. So I, I think that Carson Wentz has all the intangibles and the pieces in place to have the best season he's ever had. Well, he's got some weapons, it looks like. Uh, very intrigued by that. Deshaun Jackson, by the way, saying he wants to play for another three or four years. Uh, the speed seems to be there. Can he stay healthy? That'll be a big factor. we got plenty more during football at four this week on Thursday show with Adam Kaplan, who will be here from Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, uh, Andrew's back on Friday, and uh, we will be just a couple of weeks away from the opener against Washington and uh, more football at four powered by the Inside the Birds podcast on Thursday show. Remember, no football at four tomorrow with the Flyers game at 3 o'clock. He is Andrew DiCecco, A. DiCecco NFL on Twitter, and he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. Andrew, take care. You too, guys.